Welcome back to the Vault Cast. This is a twofer with Tim Daniel and DB Andre, the writing dynamic duo that are tearing up comic stores, not just with their work at Vault, which we obviously talk about, but they've got books at Mad Cave. They got stuff that hasn't been announced yet at other places. They've been absolutely destroying as of late. So we get into their individual histories with comics, how they came to it what life before fame was like, and what the writing process with a writing partner looks like in comics. At least here's one great example for you of a team that is absolutely killing it. There's some fantastic insights on working with other people, stretching yourself when it comes to genre, and how to package things well to get a pitch looked at. Really insightful information. Any aspiring writers are going to want to listen to this episode. So please enjoy this episode of The Vault Cast, our interview with Tim Daniel and D.B. Andre. We are joined for this thoughtful <laughs> and pensive discussion by two modern legends in the industry, Mr. Tim Daniel and Mr. D.B. Andre. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on the Vaultcast. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks for having us. Hometown. Well, glad to have you both. Now, a lot of people are going to already be familiar with some of your work, but I think most people are going to be less familiar with your origins. You know, everybody loves to know how somebody broke into comics, but I always like to take it back just a little bit further. What were some of the stories growing up, comics or otherwise, could be film, could be television, whatever, you know, novels, that really started you down the path of a creative life that maybe first got those inklings of like, someone made this thing that I'm watching, that I'm reading that I'm enjoying. I think I want to make things too. Can you remember any specific stories early on in your life that had that kind of impact on you? Yeah, definitely. You can tell by the color of my beard that <laughs> I was one of those 10-year-olds that saw Star Wars in the theater. Pop culture seemed to always influence me, but that moment, you know, age 10, going to the theater and seeing Star Wars for the first time, I remember the theater. I remember who I went with. I remember what time of day it was. I remember exiting the theater and there was a small little glass case in the lobby that had a program and it was like $2.50, little kind of color program. And I begged and I pleaded and I begged for my mom to buy that for me. I didn't exit the theater with that program, but I went home and I did what most people did at the time in the absence of having a wealth of things to buy or visit or dig into. I started drawing X-Wing and TIE Fighters. And so Star Wars definitely right up there. And then right around the same time, went to a friend's house around the corner. Probably two years later, I was 12 years old. He had a three ring binder with sheets of plastic and inside these sheets of plastic were comics. And as I was turning it, I opened it up and I hit the X-Men. And at the time in the early 80s, late 70s, this was Claremont and Byrne. This was the X-Men. And it was like a lightning bolt hit me again. So Star Wars, X-Men, and that really were the two that really kicked it off. And that X-Men, Claremont and Burn X-Men, that, that was instantaneous love of comic books right then and there. You know, I remember seeing Empire in the theater and Indiana Jones in the theater, but really I didn't connect that to like, oh, I want to do something like that. That was just something I enjoyed. You know, I went to a very small school, like 30 kids in my class and sixth grade when I was 12, funny that Tim mentions that same age, a kid transferred to my school and he sat at his desk and he pulled out Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issue number two. Nice. I saw that and I'm like, Oh, what is that? Because I had seen comics on spinner racks and stuff, but it nothing really resonated like those indie comics of the mid and early 80s. And as soon as I saw that, I started making my own comics. And, you know, me and my friend would get together all summer and we'd draw panels and, you know, try to make a cool story, which was totally ripped off of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And that was like, I saw it on that page and I said, yeah, that's what I want to do. I never thought of like making a movie you're making a TV show, but the second I saw a comic book, I'm like, I want to make one of those. Well, first you imitate, and then you iterate, and then you innovate, right? That's yeah. the process for figuring out how to do... We're still on the middle. <laughs> <laughs> iterate, iterate, iterate. Let's just keep trying. Tim, I have to tell you, while they're separated by you know a couple of decades, I have a very similar Star Wars experience myself, because in 1997, when they re-released them in theaters for the 20th anniversary, I was seven years old. I know, I'm a child. I'm 33, guys. But I had an asthma attack the day before. And I have three sisters. I didn't do a lot of stuff one-on-one -on -one with my parents. It was usually big groups. But my dad took me to go see Star Wars. Now, 
keep in mind, this is the guy who didn't go to see Star Wars until it had been in theaters for over a year because he didn't believe the hype. So he wasn't a diehard of any kind, but I can remember the feel of the seats. I can remember the smell of the theater. And I just remember that first boom of the Williams score. And then, you know, the scrawling text and everything. And when Darth Vader steps into frame, my dad leans over to me and goes, see, Dan, he's got asthma too. And from that moment, I was hooked. Like I was in a galaxy far away and I was never coming back. Those things like that, oddly enough that we've all talked about a similar age range, they're so formative and they're so powerful because there's a purity to your discovery. And it doesn't come with a set of expectations or you're not being pre-sold something. And at that age, when you discover stuff, I don't care what it is, you know, it could be Barbie, it could be the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, it could be Star Wars, doesn't matter. But I think when you discover things like that and they speak to you, you know it and it comes from a place that's so pure and so genuine that they tend to stick with you for the rest of your life. When you cut through the sort of linguistic nexus through which we all view everything, the world that we live in where everything is, especially nowadays, hyper scrutinized and things have think pieces written about them. And we talk about them in the context of canon and pop culture and the broader cultural discussion that can instantly give you expectations or taint you or make you feel like you should feel a certain way. But especially at those ages, and I know you've got to kind of witness this again, Tim, with your kids growing up, watching them discover things that maybe you introduced it to them, but watching it through fresh eyes. Either of you within the creative process ever try to hearken back to those days, try to remind yourself, get back into the mind of a child. Like if I was purely experiencing this story and I don't know anything about comics, I don't know anything about horror or fantasy or sci-fi, what is this going to do for me? What's the experience going to be here? Yeah, constantly. That's like a real touchstone. It's like, you know, this every comic could be someone's first comic. And we talked about this with some more recent projects. It's like, I want to recreate that feeling of watching E.T. in the theater, but put it in a comic, you know, where you're scared, you're confused, you're excited, you're happy. All these things, you know, happen all at once and you don't really know where it's going to go. You don't know how it's going to end because you haven't been exposed to a thousand things before. So, yeah, I think definitely we try to get to that headspace a lot and subvert expectations for people who have them and create like a new experience for someone who hasn't seen anything like this before. It's been our mission. You know, I think it's reflected already in the books we've done, whether it's End After End or Nightfall Denizen and so forth, you know, the projects that are coming up, you don't see a lot of repetition. And what I think that relates to is the fact that we're looking to discover things collaboratively, creatively, and hopefully in that process of discovery, it translates to the experience for the reader. It's a new experience for them. It doesn't feel as if it's exploiting something. I mean, look, certainly no one's scot-free from influence, but it's impossible. And so our conversations, DB, correct me if I'm wrong, but they often hit on touchstones that we can talk a common language about mainly. Yeah. And then if you are aware of your influences, you can either lean into those or let's take a hard left turn away from those. And so we can play around with the reader. We can play around with ourselves that way. It's like, let's take this scene that was from like Saving Private Ryan and put it in end after end. But let's do our take on it. And what are we trying to tell with that's different than the movie version? And yeah, I think you have to be aware of your influences so you don't just iterate over and over again and you can find something new. I always refer to one of the Pixar rules is like always throw out your first idea. It came too easy and it's too obvious. You know, you probably throw out your first six ideas. I think that's a really special thing about having a co-writer who's so collaborative like Tim is that, you know, he starts laying a path one way and then I'll take it and we'll go a slightly different way and then he'll take it back and steer us a different way. So it becomes something hopefully greater than what we could do individually, taking the best parts of both of us and putting it together. And it goes in directions that maybe we didn't expect either of us and we come up with something like better than we could come up on our own. So how did this partnership get started? How did you two meet? There was a Skybound booth at San Diego Comic-Con. We were booth babes. Booth babes, yeah. We were there to be booth babes and ended up working real hard. The show had just been announced. So there was very little footage and they had a big Hall H thing and Walking Dead turned out to be like the most 
talked about popular thing at the show that year. And Tim was there because he, he did graphic design for Skybound. And I was there because I had a friend who was a friend to the editor, Cena Grace of Skybound. And they're like, hey, you want to come work the booths? You'll get to go to Comic-Con for free. And we worked. It was intense. And we kind of bonded in the trenches of San Diego Comic-Con. At least 10 years ago now. And, you know, 12 hour days, almost a full week and almost a decade passes. It's 2019. And as we all know, in 2019, things changed. And so uh, we gave each other a call, more or less. We just checked in with each other as friends do. How you doing? What's happening in Sacramento? What's happening in Missoula? We're exchanging, you know, our experiences with the pandemic. And in that course of that conversation, this light bulb goes off. How have we known each other this long? And we've never <laughs> bothered to work with one another. Well, and I had always utilized Tim as a resource. I'm not a resource for anything, but I was self-publishing. I'm like, hey, can you do a cover for me? Hey, can you put this book together? Hey, can you read this script and see if it's any good? Yeah, you know, and Tim had been a creator and, and had been published and everything. And so we were kind of on, you know, slightly different, but almost parallel path. And yeah, he just said one day, you want to do something together? I'm like, does a guy who has already published a bunch of books want to do something with me? Should I do that? Yeah, I think <laughs> I'll do that. And this is after Resident had already been picked up and was happening, right? Yeah, Resident was done and written. And I probably had like six or seven other pitches that were going around and not really going anywhere. And I think for me, it was very frustrating time because I felt like, hey, Resident did pretty good. But if that was trying to push the door open into the comic industry, the door kind of slammed right back in my face pretty hard. So it didn't really feel like I got any traction from that. You're always thinking about quitting comics constantly. But that was a pretty strong idea in my head at the time. So if Tim had not come around there, you know, might not be any more of me out there. It's a very frustrating pursuit. Well, I've asked people on this show before, how did you break into comics? And they say, which time? I'll let you know when it happens. Right. The nature of, you know, such an interesting industry where you have several publishers, all with various special all with different editors looking for various different things. And there's no standardized process for pitching. Everybody's a little bit different. People want scripts a different way. They want pitches a different way. Everything is so unique and tailored. It's not like doing the water bottle tour in LA, right? Where you go out and meet with team producers and it's kind of the same thing at each one. You got to find different relationships at Boom, then you would at Vault, then you would at Image, then you would at Dark Horse. From the publisher side, it's a pretty big commitment to say, hey, let's do a book. It's like producing a movie. And so everybody's about mitigating risk. And so if someone has a track record, you know, that's why you see the same names on a bunch of different books from a bunch of different companies. Because once someone has been really established, you're like, okay, that person comes with a a group of fans. I know they're going to do the work. I know it's going to be at a certain quality. Let's do a book with them. And that eventually is the goal to get a good enough name that people want to work with you. But getting to that point is not easy. Plus the delivery of the actual product. You can be great to work with, but if the book isn't materializing, then that can be a problem. So this was a process of many, many years for you, DB, going self-published and then finding some spots to be published and then hooking up with Tim. How has your writing life changed since you two have gotten together? Obviously, you know, collaborating is a very different animal than working solo. How has the writing life changed first off in your, you know, just sort of your work habit? You know, how are you writing differently than you were when you were doing it before? And then in that pitch process in getting things considered and looked at by people, how is it different now working with another person trying to bust down these doors and get stuff picked up at places. Well, on that one first, Tim knows everybody. (laughs) You know, Tim knows every human that has ever touched a comic book. He could definitely cold email and cold call much easier than me. I know Tim. (laughs) And that's the extent of my comic book in. But the writing process for me has simplified immensely because, and I said this before, Tim does all the parts that I hate. (laughs) And I think I do all the parts that he can struggle with sometimes, you know? So Tim is great at plotting out, you know, a 20 volume masterpiece that has multiple iterations and books and, you know, spinoffs and populate with characters and worlds and design. And I'm great at looking at four feet in front of me and writing that part of the script. So I love it because I don't have to do any of the crap that I hate, like (laughs) outlines and coming up with pitch documents. I go, oh, Tim, you do that. And he goes, okay, cool. And he does it. Yeah, I mean, look, I'll sum it up in a nutshell. Asked, which is wonderful because DB, he's the blind spot. He's the gaps. He's the bridge. He goes to places I won't. He goes to places I won't even think of. He will look at possibilities. My mind does not work that way totally. 
And so it is a beautiful sort of combination of elements that strength for strength. And I think we've learned not only in terms of the actual nuts and bolts, outlining, scripting, you name it. But I also think we've honed process just simply by doing so much over the last four years. So those four years have contained probably legitimately 12 to 15 actual developed pitches. And that doing, that iterating, that doing has just been fast and free. You know, to David's credit, he's probably the most egoless person I know. And I think I have a very healthy ego. And so it grounds me and it keeps me more true at the same time working with David. And I never feel a sense of competitiveness or top dog. I feel a sense of true collaboration. And I feel confident knowing that if I create sort of a cardboard framework of a character, that David is simply going to flesh that out, breathe real life into it, bringing humanity to each one of those characters and see them in ways I never conceived of. And Tim is extremely giving as a creator. I call him the machine gun of ideas because he shoots them out me. I go, no, that one, no, that one. Yes, take that one. And he doesn't care that I shot down 10 of his ideas and we just keep going. And, you know, he'll give me a pitch and I'll go, you know, this in an outline. I'm go, okay, this is cool. I'm going to tear this all down and then rebuild it. Is that cool? He's like, yeah, go for it. So it's best idea wins, but it's also, it's climbing with a harness or ride a bike with like training wheels. I have so much freedom to go fast because I know someone's behind me going to look at everything that I do and pick up any mistakes that I made or any gaps that are there. Having a co-rider just frees you up to make mistakes if you need to, because you have that second pair of eyes on it. And Tim is very meticulous and thoughtful when I am fast and reckless. <laughs> the typical conversation on a weekend goes something like this. Did you read the outline I sent you two weeks ago? And I'll say, yes, David, I finally got to it. And I'll say, it'll be coming back to you at the end of the weekend. And I'll send it back. And typically the response is, everything's there plus the opportunity. And it's like, that's it. It's not about was this right or wrong, good or bad. It's just everything is there all the intent is in place. Opportunities, this is where we might have some opportunities in terms of character, plot, you name it. And then that's given back to David and then he selects from that menu and then brings even more opportunities back as a result. So it's just one opportunity after the next. That's my feeling of it, of the process that we go through each week. It's a creative smorgasbord. You know, you're making choices, you're leaving things behind, taking what works and running with it and just building the plane around you as you go. And it sounds like that's taken you pretty far at this point. I am curious about some of the other relationships in your life and how those come to bear on your creative process, specifically your jobs outside of writing comics. Because Tim, you know, obviously you're a full-time designer, you're a head of design and branding for Vault Comics. And then DB, you also have a thriving career as a physical therapist. So you're doing things outside Outside of your own individual creative projects, how does your life outside of the thing you're writing help or hurt the thing that you're writing? I think for me, it's extremely helpful because I meet 12 people a day, you know, on an average day and 12 different people from 12 different backgrounds with different jobs, and different histories and different cultures and different family experiences. Some of these have directly influenced characters like Paxton and Resident was 100% based on a patient that I had who was a single black father and had a daughter who would come to his visits with him. Like he was so caring and so attentive to his daughter and she was so smart and so like curious and engaged and would ask questions about his treatment and everything. So I was just blown away by these two people and they became Paxton and Beck. I think I saw them and I'm like, I haven't seen that dynamic presented in media very often. So I want to show that in the book. And so I think it's great to have a job outside of writing or have experiences outside of writing. Write what you know is one of the most overused phrases in the world, but you can only write what you've experienced and write it honestly and write it and have truth behind the writing and have it feel real to the reader. So I think the more life experiences you have, the more things you can write. So I really appreciate my job exposing me to so many different people. 
Yeah, I think that's where the humanity, you know, comes from a lot of the times. I mean, that was certainly one of the things that first interested me when David sent me his first self-published work, Last Supper. First of all, I had no clue. I was like, wow, you know, this guy I met in a booth at Comic-Con, you know, selling t-shirts and hardcovers of Invincible and Compendiums of the Walking Dead. This guy can write. And not only can he write, he wrote something that I find to be impossible. We were just talking about it the other night. You know, he wrote a romance, a drama with no hook and no real genre behind it, just simply presenting these two characters at a place in their life, stunned by that. And I think that's where the humanity comes from that I saw. And I wanted that as a part of what I was doing. And thank goodness, you know, and you see it in Resonant. And now you see it in things like End After End with Walt. Then you see it in Denison. You know, my experience is a little different. My world has shrunk considerably in terms of what I experience and the influences I have, but it's also grown at the same time. And that is this. I spend my day absorbing comic books, absorbing them nonstop. And I've been doing it now for 15, almost 20 years. And I started designing in 2003. And so it's been 20 years this year where I started designing. And so all I've done is absorb graphics, visuals, scripts, outlines, pitches, pitch docs, motion pictures, you name it. I've been asked to do so many different things. I just sponge that in. I just sponge it in. I can kind of tell what works, what I'm looking for, you know, what I feel is might be a missing piece in the marketplace that might be missing from shelves, that might be appealing to readers. I can see a book come to us at Vault and I kind of have a feeling about it. I mean, I kind of know right away by the pitch, by the visuals. And so my world has shrunk because I'm here in this basement every day, (laughs) but my world has grown tremendously through the exposure to an infinite number of, of books that we've worked on the last seven years at all. And if you look at what me and Tim both gravitate to, there's a lot of family and a lot of family relations. And I think Tim's experience with his direct family and his deaded family, you know, my experience with my family, that stuff's all going to be in every single thing that we do. We just can't get away from it. So, you know, you mind those areas of stress, you mind those areas of anxiety, you kind of pull apart the things that bother you the most and stick it in a book. And, you know, you kind of work through it as therapy, but also try to just make sense of your world and that immediate world around you with your relationships. So you'll always find that stuff in our books too. DB, you're doing my job for me. That's a beautiful segue into the background and the pitch for folks who aren't familiar of Denizen specifically, because I know it's a very personal story and comes from a very real place of family strife and you know, family coming together. So if you wouldn't mind, can you tell the folks at home, your new book, Denizen, what's it about and where did it come from? Wow. Is it a Christmas story or not? That's the big question. (laughs) That is the question. There's Christmas lights in it. There's Christmas presents in the back of the family Jeep. It's about a family that's trying to come together and they're coming together on this road trip to see grandma. And while it's never specifically stated in the book, this family has been separated from grandma by, you guessed it, an event the size of the pandemic. And they're on their way to California and their last stop before they hit California is the Sonoran Desert. And they pull into a KOA campground. But that's not satisfying enough for dad. Dad wants to impress what are going to be his new daughters through marriage. He's going to impress them with an authentic experience in the Sonoran Desert. So he drives the family out into the desert and they get hit with a flood. And they're forced to return to this now abandoned KOA. Because if you've ever been down south, the monsoons come, and when they come, they're pretty violent. They can be flash flooding. There can be, you know, some pretty weather. So they return to the KOA, and mom stumbles upon a small, empty Airstream camper. And what she finds inside more or less literally tears her consciousness apart. And the family is then faced with the challenge of figuring out what has happened to their mother and whether or not it's, in fact, something they can reverse or overcome or cure or stop or live with. Wouldn't you say, DB? Yeah. Sounds good to me. You know, where's it come from? Well, it came from a personal place. You know, it came from a place where over the last several years, I watched both of my in-laws who are in their mid seventies really show the effects of dementia. And it started me thinking just in general about this idea of this invisible force that starts to affect primarily one person of the family. And then it sort of mushrooms out from there. It sort of tentacles its way out into the family. And it shows itself in many ways. And I've seen this happen with my daughters, ages 
11 and 25, you know, and my wife watching her parents go through this, you know, in approaching DB and just sort of spilling out this idea of, hey, can this family go to this campground? We started talking about that. And it was a way me personally to feel like I had some control over something that was and still is way out of my control. What is that like to take something that is so personal and something that you're living through right now into a partnership? It's one thing to process, you know, with a therapist or to process on your own or process with family members, but to take something something and bring it into a project where you're now sharing ideas, you're swapping things back and forth, you're very open, but you're kind of ripping open your chest for your partner and going, hey, so here's this thing that's on my heart. You want to take a look at this? How does that change the dynamic when you're, you know, talking about something that might be a little more sort of general, you know, fiction that's might not necessarily come from such a personal place? How does that change or enhance your dynamic as you're working together? That's the only way I know how to work. I want to get to the raw meat of it and I want to get as exposed as possible. And so that's every conversation that we have together about this sort of thing is like, you have to be 100% open, 100% honest. Nothing gets sugarcoated or painted with a rosy glow because you want to have a real character and a real reaction. And you want to actually probably put your worst reactions in there. When did I handle something poorly? When did I make a bad decision? So your characters can do that too and then hopefully learn from that. So, you know, the way we do it and the way I've heard from other co-writers, it's a very intense, has to be very honest and open relationship. It's another like marriage between me and Tim. And I have to tell him, you know, my most embarrassing secrets <laughs> and the worst things about myself, the things I absolutely hate about myself. So then we can put them in characters and we can make those characters real and have faults because other people have those faults and other people can connect to that character. You know, unless the point of it is to be soft and poppy, we want to write real characters in every situation that we can. And the only way to get a real character is to express a real emotion, real fears, you know, your real dreams, your the things that haunt you at night, the things that get you excited. And so I think Tim was 100% open and honest with me. And I think I'm at a 100% open and honest with him. And I think having a relationship for 10 years before this happened helped build that level of trust. Like, oh, I can tell this guy this and he's not going to go post it on Facebook or, you know, he's going to respect, you know, my openness. And so it has to be a safe space where you can say anything and not feel judged and know that it's not going to go past that relationship. The most beautiful thing is that in just expressing that to DB early on, this is what's happening in my household. This is what's happening with my family. And can we take this into the book? It's very much what you just said, which was like, I think at the time your reaction was, bring it. You better bring it. Like, bring it all. Like, let's go. And we find ourselves continually sort of plumbing the depths of our lives and our experiences and sharing those things with each other. And they come out in the books. Whether that's intentional or not, I think they're arriving in the books. I think about Walt Willem in End After End. And you know, Walt is a good artist. He's a craftsman. He's a good artist. He's looking to find his voice. And when we meet him in that story, and he's frustrated by, I think, the limitations of where he's at when he was alive. Spoiler alert, he dies on the second page. But he's frustrated by that. And he's frustrated by the limitations of his voice. And he's frustrated by how the world is receiving his art. And he's looking to get beyond that, but he's not seeing the value in what he's doing. And I find that to be a personal story for both DB and I in such a way that we're looking to express ourselves, share the value of our stories, hope it gets recognized. And like, how is that not a universal thing that artists or creators of any type don't experience? to some degree, even at the heights of their, you know, their careers. Now, do you find when you're looking at something like Walt's story or like the story in Denison, where you have sort of a real world issue or frustration that you're dealing with, whether that is a family going through dementia, an artist failing to be recognized, how much time do you spend thinking about and talking about the issue? I don't think anyone would accuse you of writing issue stories, right? Or like some sort of heavy handed after school special kind kind of, you know, proselytizing piece. A very special episode. Exactly. Without it being a very special episode. Walt finds a joint. What? Walt? Oh, Walt, come on. But then, you know, how do you walk that line where you, you have something that you really do want to talk about and is so important to the characters and to the story that you're telling, but not letting the message or the issue
issue, you know, just hijack the story and turn it into a lecture or an after school special? How do you manage that in your process? And how much time do you dedicate to just discussing the issue that you want to explore? You know, okay, first answering the issue of how long do we spend talking about a certain thing that might motivate us or a certain aspect that might motivate us, whether it's Walt with his art and his artistic voice or you know, the family of Denizen. We don't, you know, it's organic. It becomes a discovery, I think, less than a purposeful, let's take this thing and write this story about it. It sort of arrives, I think, it arrives to us as part of the process, figuring out the characters, what do they want, where are they going, how do they feel, how do they react to a certain obstacle or an achievement. You can't help but start to see certain things emerge in the writing that's just a part of your life. And, you know, I say that about end after end in retrospect. It wasn't a part of that first conversation that we had when DB said, well, what should we start with? Anything but fantasy. And he said, I, said, I got a fantasy idea for you. Yeah, Walt kind of organically became that person that mirrored our own frustrations. And then once we started to recognize it coming out, I think we did pull out and have some discussion about, hey, this is why he feels this way. He's an artist. And as we were developing that character, but definitely happened organically through trying to put ourselves in that book as much as possible. You know, Walt is the everyman, you know, and that he was just a guy. And the whole point of him is to kind of subvert the chosen one, you know, story arc where you're just a regular guy, but then you have a training montage by a fire. And now you're the best swordsman in the land, or you find this special power where you can zap people with your pinky finger. I don't know. He was just always going to be a guy. And so he became, you know, me and Tim, you know, frustrated with where we were in our creative lives, both of us. And it only became natural to make him an artist then. And then that opened up our eyes to what was sneaking in subconsciously. And then again, you try to recognize those things and then focus them or harness them or clarify them without it becoming, you know, this like diatribe about why don't people support the arts or sure. whatever. You got to stay true to the character and true to the story. I think it's important to recognize it takes a lot of self introspection <laughs> that can sometimes be uncomfortable to write a true story, you know, that that has true characters in it because you are putting a lot of your own stuff out there for the world to see, you know, you're laying your soul bare through these characters, you know, I mean, Denizen, particularly for Tim, and I think end after end for both of us, it's like, we are Walt. And I can't read the end of that book without crying every single time. I can't read the end of Denizen without crying every single time. And I've read it 20 something times. And I hope that translates to the reading experience as well. I want to circle back to something you both alluded to just a moment ago, which was at the beginning of your creative partnership, Tim, you said anything but fantasy. And DB said, (laughs) here, I got a fantasy story for you. So DB, I got to know what's on the hit list of genres you're going to, you know, trick Tim into or force him into. Are we going to see a rom-com? We're going to do straight comedy. We're going to do a rom-com. We're going to do a romance. I'm going to make him do a steampunk. I was going to ask about steampunk. I know he hates steampunk. Oh, he hates steampunk. Okay, can you double up? Can you make it like a steampunk romance or a steampunk comedy? No, he wants to do the romance, so I'll do a steampunk comedy. When all is said and done, you know, years from now, this will be recorded. We'll have documented the moment where it all went wrong. (laughs) Yeah, that's right, when the relationship began to end. When they do the behind the music special about the two of you. (laughs) This is the VH1. We'll pull footage from this and make it black and white, a little grainy. Turns black and white (laughs) and slowly starts to turn. (laughs) There was trouble in paradise. He's telling the truth, though. These are literally things we just talked about this past week. He's telling the truth. That's what I love about this experience. These last four years has been all about just having sort of the freedom, the courage, and now, you know, a working relationship where, okay, sure. Yeah, you bet. You know, Tim, he's a pretty jovial, happy guy when he's not a behind the screen grump. But when you're in a social setting with him, you know, you wouldn't see all this. Let's make it darker. This is all death. And I'm like, man, let's lighten this up a little bit. Come (laughs) on, Tim. Let's put some jokes in here. (laughs) So 100%. I mean, I I don't think I wrote a line of dialogue for Grink in 10 issues. I didn't (laughs) have to do that. And he's so funny in his voice. He was made, born, and existed the minute you started talking about him. And so, yeah, that's the marvelous thing is I don't feel like I have to carry that weight. I don't have to carry that water. You will. 
and I'll get to go over here and make it really fucking grim. Always a grim comedy. <laughs> <laughs> As you're weaving together these two helixes that is the DNA of any story here, and you've got a grim energy, and you've got a comedic energy, and you're coming together, what is the pitch process like when it's two people? When you're coming together to distill it down in those early days to present something to another person, and you've got this brain trust, but then you got to bring somebody else on board and get them to buy in and get them to be a part of the brain trust. How do the two of you approach pitching? Because you've got books set up a lot of places, not just Vault. You got some things that have been announced, some more stuff coming. I know you're always working on stuff. So what is it like to work on pitches together? I give it all to Tim and he does 100% of it himself. Short answer. <laughs> He's going to pretend like I do something with the pitch process. I do absolutely nothing with the pitch process. Do you show up on the call <laughs> or come to the meeting? <laughs> no, no. I let Tim do it all. I'm like, okay, I'll be here writing. I'll just write and then you do that. Yeah, he's four or five projects ahead of me at any one point. I think if he were to show you the whiteboard right now, a lot of red T's up there. The pitch process, like, okay, here's one we're working on right now without naming names and titles and so forth. This is for all you publishers out there. DB has a 10 issue fully scripted series right now, just sitting in the can, just sitting there. And it's funny. And let's say buddy. Is that good, DB? Yeah, it's a friendship book. Yeah. And you know, this past weekend, we sit and I literally start quizzing him on it over and over and over again, visualizing it a bit and thinking, okay, if we can get one key piece of art and then we already have 10 issues scripted in the can, what can I do to take that piece of art, distill it down into less than one page pitch? And what we've been doing for publishers, and this seems to be working really well, is that we give them something instantaneously digestible as a yes or a no instant like it's a visual and then very little else like two lines three lines right. yep and we've been pitching multiple books at a time that way and that's really paid dividends because i think in this day and age the day of the magnum opus pitch it's a lot to ask it always has been a lot to ask but in this day and age especially even more to ask because we use that as a segue into providing the full pitch then, which we already have in this case. I think of it a lot like when you're working at a booth and you're like, okay, what kind of books do you like? We have, you know, this guy with a talking ax. We got a haunted house with a family. We got this post-apocalyptic drama. And the person goes, ooh, I really like post-apocalyptic. Okay. And then you go to level two of the pitch, which is like, though it's about this guy Paxton. He has to go out and find medicine for his critically ill son. We follow him as he goes out to this world and we follow the kids. They try to survive without the father and the rules of this world are there's these invisible waves of energy that force people to follow their deepest darkest impulses and then if they bite on that one then we go here's an actual outline here's an actual document you know so hook them with the little one hook them with the bigger one and then give them the full meal after that i talked about this on a previous episode with zach kaplan about selling on a floor selling at a booth and i always think of it as the pyramid and you have the one sentence lesbian vikings right you know, talking axe barbarian, you know, you have your hook. Usually lesbian Vikings does it. I'm not going to lie. There's very many times <laughs> where people just go, great, I'll take it. Lesbian Vikings, that's here at Vault because of that guy. Yeah. So there you go. He passed that book along to me before I even came to Vault. It just at the beginning. I was a Natasha fan from way back in the day. But Dan, you're right. You know, what it does, I think, for any editor, you know, or any publisher, or any decision maker at a company is it gives them the opportunity to make that split second yes, no. Because let's face it, they've got 350 more emails to get through in their inbox, or they've got Instagram messages and DMs and bullshit like that to get through. And I just want to say, this is what it looked like. And this is what it is. This is the feel for it. This is a visual that you're going to see. This is captured, and Tim's great at creating these visuals. And it is what the book is. People send me their pitches. I like to help out other writers and stuff. And a lot of these pitches are just boring and they're too long. And it's telling me all this minutia and I don't need to know all that crap. What is this book about? What are you going to try to hit me with? Why am I excited about reading this? So I think it's really effective to have this pitch structure that's almost like your life selling a book. And we've gotten a lot of interest just from those emails. Hey, we got three pitches. This is what they are. Boom, boom, boom. If you want to look at more of them or want any more information on it on any of them, here you go. And I think thinking of it like that, like you're selling the book, has been really impactful and powerful. 
Now you've taken this skill that y'all have developed for pitching, for writing, for storytelling, for getting books into and then out of the machine that is comics. And you've started something else with this. Can you explain to folks at home what Second Rocket is? I mean, it's just what we've been talking about, which is creative services for mainly for the independent creator, much like ourselves. You know, if you look around the landscape of comics and probably always have looked around the landscape of independent comics in particular, there's just not a lot of resource out there. I mean, there's information for sure. And there's tutorials and websites. I mean, go watch one of Curb Michael Russell's coloring videos and you will understand what it's required to color comics, right? But in general, helping folks shape their stories, package their stories, present their stories or ideas in such a way that is viable, that's what we've been doing. And aside from our creative partnership, we've been offering creative services, design, production, editing, lettering, coloring. And so it's a referral service that we started up that we can refer experts to other creatives so they can help tailor and shape their books, their packages. Tim's, if not the best, one of the best logo designers in the business. And you know, to have a good comic, you need a good logo. And it's got to be on the front of everything that you do with that comic. And, you know, again, when I was a self-publishing little newbie, I would get Tim to do stuff for me for free. And it's like, if I didn't have that, I have zero computer skills. So to put a PDF together for printing, when I was self-printing, self-publishing my comics, would have been impossible. It would have taken me a thousand years to figure out how to do Photoshop and it would have come out wrong. And so having that resource available for literally anybody who wants it out there, I would have paid for it at the time. I would pay for it now. I think it's really valuable. So I don't have to self-teach myself in Photoshop or InDesign or whatever computer stuff. And I can get my book with a beautiful logo. I can get my book looking professional. And really that was, you know, there's no comic book writing school or degree, but that was my business card. You know, that was some advice I got from other creators is like, make it right. That's what they always tell you. If you want to break into comics, start making comics and that's it. That's what I did. And I had comics that I would hand out. Here's this is what I've written. This is what I've written. And you want to prove that you can do it. And I think, you know, Tim, of course, wedged the door open for me. And then, you know, I stuck my elbow through and handed like Adrian my book. And like, that's how I got resident. Well, I know you say you would have paid for those services from Tim, but I can tell you having, you know, imposed on Tim for design services when I was in college for a poster for a self-produced show I was doing, you can try to pay him. He'll get violent. So don't just don't fight him. When he says, don't worry about it, he means don't worry about it and don't push the issue. A scene will be caught. I mean, ultimately, it is about wanting good, good comp. I mean, you know, you can think of the marketplace as a place of competition, or you can also think of it as a place where you can go and enjoy incredible entertainment. That's now a medium that's now driving all of pop culture, mainly all of pop culture. And so I want good comics and I want to help other people make that. That's paid off just marvelously, you know, just incredible dividends. This creative relationship is born out of just that type of thing. And so that's been more valuable to me than just about anything else. Well, folks, this episode is out here on March 4th, and Denizen is going to be in stores next week on March 13th. But where else can folks expect to see your names in the near future? What other books do y'all have coming out? What other projects can we be looking forward to? Well, this is in March. Go back in time <laughs> to January and pick up Creep Show Volume 2, Issue 5, with our story, Keep It Fed, illustrated and colored amazingly by Matt Roberts, who did Manifest Destiny. It's just an absolute beast and killed our 10 page story. And then also pick up End After End Volume 2, pick up Resident, the complete edition, all 10 issues in one volume. Yeah. And then what else, Timmy? Oh, at the end of this month, since we're in March. Since we're in March. Please pick up Morningstar, number one, March 27th from Mad Cave. There we go. Now, I'd be remiss before I let y'all go without mentioning just the third component to Denizen, the legend, Chris Sheehan, and the art that was delivered on this book. I know we talked a lot about story. We talked a lot about creative partnership. I'd be remiss if I let this episode end without letting y'all give Chris their flowers and, you know, let folks know they should be hiring Chris Sheehan. Chris, no notes, Sheehan, because I don't think I had a single note for their art. It was perfect. It was better than what was in my head, better than what I could have imagined. Absolutely perfect. 
no notes, just amazing. I think any writer, if they're really interested in seeing their book be as successful as it can be, they want that artist to outdraw their script. And that's precisely what Chris Sheen did and has. I mean, I think that's now on paper enough for everyone to know that the kind of character emoting and acting, the mood, the tone, the atmosphere, Chris is remarkable in that regard and brings a style and voice all their own. And so, yep, Chris Sheehan. Yeah, you're also going to get the best covers in the business. The absolute stunning charcoal paint multimedia. I mean, just absolutely the most haunting, beautiful covers you can imagine. And somehow Chris is getting better. I didn't think that was possible. But I think Denizen shows like Chris's quality has always been great. And I think Denizen is just another slight level up. And the covers were just amazing. I can't wait for people to get the whole thing together. Yeah, there's straight up a confidence on display there. And by the way, that's across the board from the creative team. DB, you should probably introduce our colorist because, come on, resonant. I mean, Jason Wardy, you know, I've never met him, never talked to him. I love that man with my entire soul. The <laughs> things he did on resonant, on the colors of resonant, I literally cried when I saw those first colored pages. And when I look at the black and whites and then look at the color, there's no way that guy shouldn't have won 10 Eisners that year and won Eisners in perpetuity for just that book. Absolutely stunning, amazing work. His color work on this, absolutely stellar. Uh, I can't say enough good things about that guy and the way he worked and his professionalism takes every project and it becomes absolutely true to what that project's intent is. It's not just, I'm going to color this. I'm going to look at the intent of this project and I'm going to match the color art to what you wanted the mood to be, what you wanted the feel to be. It's the soundtrack of the comic. It's the mood. It's the pacing. It's everything. And we worked with him again on Morningstar. And if you look at Resident, look at Denizen, look at Morningstar, you would never know that's the same colorist, but also you would definitely know it's the same colorist because of his dedication to enhancing the art that's there, adding the layers that need to be added. Just an absolute color beast that I would work with on every single project forever for the rest of my life and then into the afterlife. Absolutely. And I want to mention Justin Birch, who came over from Anworld Design and Justin's on Denizen, as well as on Morningstar. And just like Jason Wordy, there's a confidence on display in both books. And I think in particular on latter part of Denizen, right away from on Morningstar, where it's just such a perfect decision on his part as to the letters and evocative of what it is, of the tone. And I think Justin's greatest strength in Denizen is that he found Helene's voice when Helene is going into 40 different directions at the same time and speaking from memory and history and present. He really figured that out and really brought that to Denizen. And so Justin Birch rounds out our creative team for that book. Thank you both so much for joining us. This is a pretty rad episode. So I hope we can have you back here again soon for a roundtable about another discussion. Tim, we're going to do a design deep dive at some point. We'll get after it again. But thank you both so much. And that's our show. The Vaultcast is produced by Daniel Crary and Kyle Foucher. It is edited by Kyle Foucher. Social media support by Britta Bisher. The Vaultcast logo was designed by Tim Daniel, our guest today. Copyright 2024 Vault Comics. All rights reserved. Thank you so much, folks.